Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, welcome, Steven Erickson. I'm very happy to have you here. I'm very uh, proud because I've read your books for many years, and it's a great moment for me to have you here on my channel. Um, well, thank you for the invitation. Yeah. And um, the channel is newly started, so I will just briefly say some words about that. It's um, focus is mythology and fantasy, and uh, it's not only Malasan. It will be a lot of Malasan because I'm very interested in in your books and in mythology. And I think Malasan makes you know a good example of how to to maybe uh, make uh, mythology a bit easier, but still accessible for readers, but mm -hmm. it's still a very advanced Malasan. So it's uh, it's still something challenging for readers. So it will be focused on Malasan and mythology. And uh, this interview, I hope to focus a bit about uh, the mytho mythological aspects of Malasan. Great. And yeah. Aspects of Malasan. So so we'll see where we'll, we will end. Uh, mm -hmm. The channel is new, uh, the subscribers are not so many, but those who are here are usually, uh, mostly Malasan readers. Some of them are experienced, but I know also there are some readers who have just started to read Malasan, so we should try to be spoiler-free. Got it. Right. That can be difficult, but uh, we will try, mm -hmm. right? No, I, I'm getting better at it, for sure. Yeah, right. Uh, and my own Malasan reading started uh, four years ago. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think during the pandemic, when it started, right. uh, I was recommended your book, Gardens of the Moon, from a friend or by a friend. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just... Um, in Sweden? Yeah, in Sweden. Yeah. In Sweden. Uh, and he, uh, like, you know, I just asked for advice. I need something new to read. So and he said, uh, Gardens of the Moon. And he said, it's it's a lot to read, but if you take your time, it's worth it. That was his message. So I downloaded it on the phone because I mm -hmm. was very eager just to check it out. Oh, I love your wallpaper. Yeah. The Garnier. Yeah, very cool. And um, um, uh, so actually, I read half the book on the phone. Hmm. Because I was waiting for, I ordered it and I had to wait for the book. So I really liked it, of course. So, um, um, and I was not so, some people are puzzled, you know, think your books are challenging, things like that. I thought it was interesting. It was very different from what I've read before. I've read uh, Lord of the Rings, of course, but Dark Tower, I've read a lot. And mm. um, uh, Name of the Wind, books like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then I've read, read a lot of mythology, so especially Hindu mythology and also uh, Nordic pagan mythology as well. So I thought there were a lot of uh, deep stuff in your book, so it kept me uh, attentive, right. and I continue reading. So that's a bit about my reading. So. Uh, I, actually, my wife had a question before I sure. went to the room, like, how... Uh, we will, uh, for the for the viewers, I, I want to say we will uh, talk about four things. Today it's world building, uh, in, inspiration that you have from mythologies. That's the second topic. Malasan and spirituality and how to write so we remember. Uh, it will be uh, approximately approximately an hour uh, plus an hour plus. So that's good for you to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she asked how come you you know started to write at all i mean from the beginning how how, how did this happen um, writing in Ma, in the malasan world uh well i mean i i sort of backed into uh the fantasy genre um because i was writing um contemporary fiction short stories um which was sort of the expectation um for the the writing programs that, that I, I entered uh the university of victoria and later on um the Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, but in terms of what turned me to writing was I wanted to be, I wanted to do comic books. And so I was an illustrator, but this is in the pre-digital age where if you're going to do a comic book, you had to expect to spend a lot of time doing it, unless you had a team of people who could do the inking and the coloring and all the rest. Um, but it was just me. So it was too much work to do the illustrations and the narrative impulse took over. And so that led me into fiction. Um, but of course, 
um, I was always interested in fantasy and I'd always been, I grew up reading that stuff. Um, I think the first, you know, once I got past, you know, like the Hardy Boys and, and you know, the, the, the YA stuff, um, the first stuff I was reading was uh, Robert E. Howard and Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, prim primarily because the editions that were coming out at the time were illustrated on the front covers by Frank Rosetta, who was my favorite um, artist. Um, and I mean, his stuff was just extraordinary. If you think that I came out of that sort of illustrative background, then, you know, that's what drew my, drew my attention. So I was always interested in fantasy, um, but I was quite happy to explore writing um, and the craft of writing um, through the, uh, the genre of um, contemporary fiction. Um, although as, as I proceeded there in short fiction, especially, I started sort of pushing the boundaries even, you know, like in, in, in the stories I submitted to the, the university programs. Um, but of course they would have called that magic realism. Um, but in many respects, I was starting to sort of write tall tales of one form or another. Um, and then, so that's all the writing side of things, but the other side of course is as an archeologist, and having met Ian S. Lamont, also an archaeologist, on a dig, um, we sort of had a, a, a built-in um, interest in, once we started gaming, in applying what we knew uh, in terms of anthropology and archaeology um, to the world building that, that we were creating. So we wanted something sort of geologically consistent, um, geographically accurate, um in terms of you know hydrology and, and all that kind of things um and of course when once you know as an archaeologist when you get out to environments like that you quickly discover the um the fact that it is the environment's characteristics that actually shape the cultures that arise from in that environment hmm. so um that gave us kind of a a, a, a guidepost if you will to um, once you, once you produce the maps and you create, you know, is this temperate, is this tropical, semi-tropical, subtropical, uh, arid, semi-arid, um, and then you start thinking of, uh, placement of cities and, and settlements, um, you're basing that off of sort of what we know about, um, historically, um, the rise of, of cities and, and, and the rest and how they relate to things like, uh, water source, um, potential irrigation, um, coastal adaptation, uh, maritime adaptation. So all of these things just sort of plug in uh, once, you, once you've drawn your maps. And of course, I love drawing maps. So, mm. so was, was the maps, uh, when, when you start to build, you could say, the Malassan world, was the mm -hmm. map, maps was the, you know, the first you did? Uh, yeah, yeah. You, and and but, they started... Um, in very localized areas. So, you know, the first maps didn't even reach a continental edge anywhere. It was just somewhere. Um, and I think the first map I did was a fairly close in one of uh, North Ganabacus um, around Motwood. And so that was related to the campaigns that, that you know, we, we were doing um, with the bridge burners uh, in the games. So again, yeah. Um, the map was uh, of a scale that it, it it covered maybe two cities at the most, and the rest was sort of forest and, and rivers and um, various drainage drainage patterns into swamps and all the rest. And so, um, yeah. And then from there, we started the maps started building themselves outwards, and um, whenever we were so inclined, we just added another continent. Mm. Um, just to it, basically the adventure, so to speak. Yeah, you, well, and, yeah. And, and to shift the shift the cultures, um, mm -hmm. really shift them, um, mm -hmm. so that we had a lot of variety um, in terms of the cultures. Mm -hmm. What because you were role playing? Were you? Mm -hmm. Was it you and ENC, or it was more people who were role playing? Initially, just the two of us. Mm -hmm. I would I would run a campaign, and we probably alternate nights. I mean, we were we were staying in you know the same flat in. Uh, here in Victoria, because he was in the writing program as well, uh, a year a year before, a year later than me, um, if not two years, I can't remember. 
but anyways yeah because we shared a flat um and we we're both relatively quick writers in terms of fiction we had a lot of spare time in our hands and um so we just started building this this uh this malazan world um and and kind of building the history and the backstory to it um i don't think we realized at the time that it was going to be backstory but it became the backstory mm -hmm. and if, you know, i think we even had one campaign that pushed it back to the bronze age where um the the coastlines changed because uh, the sea levels were different mm -hmm. uh, so we always had that idea of of you know what what are the sort of the foundational um starting points if you will of of various civilizations uh that, that we were sort of gaming mm -hmm. um and then of course once you sort of open it up to non-human sentience and non-human civilizations then it becomes a lot more intriguing uh, because then you can layer things uh, even deeper mm -hmm. mm. so first maps and then characters came into the picture mm -hmm. like you mentioned bridge burners then i think mm -hmm. about whiskey jack and you know all this yeah. but mm -hmm. they were there from the start so Pretty early. Um, I mean, the first characters were Anaman that I played that were Anamander Rake, um, Kaladin Brood, mm -hmm. uh, and the character who became uh, Queen of Dreams. Mm -hmm. the, and so that's the thing. When there's only two people uh, gaming, uh, each the player needs to basically have at least three characters, mm -hmm. uh, two or three anyways, um, just to, you know, um, allow that kind of... Uh, multiple pronged approach uh, mm -hmm. to any kind of dilemma or story and, and spreading out the the skill abilities and, and talents as well mm. so um yeah that trio uh traveled around for a fair bit in the early games mm. kaladin anamander and um her name was tris at the time yeah right okay. yeah so um it was only later that um i think cam first stumbled on he'd been reading glenn cook but uh, the black company arrived um as a publication and around that time i was uh i was reading all kinds of vietnam war literature and um we found this extraordinary sort of synergy that was produced uh by the black company by glenn cook stuff and that really inspired us into the military side of, of uh, hmm. gaming and that's where you know the bridge burners and the crimson guard uh, all arose yeah, I think um, about the military aspect. Um, I sometimes watch Band of Brothers. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think there are, you know, I feel the connection, maybe not with Malas, but, you know, with the army life. And the yeah. Um, they have and the jokes they have and things. Like yeah. Uh, it's interesting that, um, you know, the humor that, at least I, both Cam and I would, would put into the military side of things. Uh, we drew from our, our, our experience on archaeological digs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know now, because my, my son's an archaeologist in Winnipeg, um, <clears throat> the, the digs that are run these days are very different from the ones that, that Cam and I were on. Um, generally, a lot of the digs now are, well, first they're, they're rescue um, or salvage oriented so there's construction going on and when there's construction going on in the countryside um there's a construction camp and so that's where the archaeologists end up you know being stationed so um my son was telling me you've got you know three meals a day fantastic meals uh, all you can eat basically mm -hmm. uh trailers that you're staying in uh full plumbing you know the works um yeah it's it, it's it's a different it's a different experience um the digs cam and i were on we had a tent and you know mm -hmm. we had coal and stoves um so white gas fired stoves which could blow up on occasion and often mm -hmm. did mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and so yeah we were really sort of it's quite i mean it was remote um places that were difficult to get to and get out of um and we'd be on 10 days in the bush and 40s um if we could uh, mm -hmm. back in the city um 
So what happens in those in those environments of seven or eight people um, sort of thrown together um, is you're you're kind of you're subjected to the to the environment uh, to a very very sort of raw and exposed way, um, and people respond to that in in different ways, mm -hmm. and it can become very amusing. Um, not always amusing. I mean, some people go fairly bushed. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, you mentioned Dark Towers, so Stephen King's The Shining. Mm. Uh, it's all about being being bushed, right? Um, that's what happens to Jack, and and I I've seen that side of things too. So, um, but it was the digs that that sort of uh, honed our our sense of humor in terms of the gaming, and then from the gaming into the books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very fun to read read the humor in the books as well. So there are many perspectives in, in your books, I think, that readers can enjoy. If we um, we would leave the world building a little world building a little bit, but mm -hmm. maybe go into mythology, uh, if it's okay for you. Yeah. Uh, um, there is a lot of mythology in, in uh, Malasan. There are many traditions and uh, religions and uh, uh, you know tribal people who have faith and the shamans and all of these kind mm -hmm. of things. so uh, as some of my viewers on the channel already know I read a lot of mythology at the moment I'm reading this uh, I won't talk about it so much now but in Swedish it is it's the yeah maybe you see it's the Iliad well I'm glad you brought that one up because that, that's one of the primary inspirations um, yeah for the books is the Iliad yeah because that's um you know opposite inspiration for me then because i i read the malasan and then i got interested in i talked a bit too with philip chase so yeah mm -hmm. he you know, confirmed a bit that iliad and and your books has connected yeah. but i i read iliad in school but then i was small it wasn't so fun you know way of teaching no. iliad so but i'm now i'm reading it and um also, is that version is that version in prose or is it verse? No, it's in verse. Yeah. It's in verse. Yeah. Cool. So I'm, I'm actually reading it mostly loud when the family is away. So it's easy. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And also Mahabharat or Mahabharat. Mm -hmm. Any people in English say. I I've read not all of it because that's huge. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can get a hold of it, but the parts of it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, when I read your books, I think there are a lot of connections with uh, mm -hmm. mythology. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on that? How what you yeah, what you're... Um, definitely part of my my university uh, schooling. Uh, I plunged into into those areas, um, even before I thought I was going to be a writer. Um, there was something that that uh, evoked something in me. Um, that sent me in those directions. Um, I remember taking a a, a course, um, Old Norse mythology, um, and I mean there were three students and 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 two teachers basically. So it wasn't a big class, yeah. um, but it was great fun. It was great yeah. fun. And then on the other side, because I was one of my minors was classics, um, I was reading a lot of uh, Greek literature in translation. Um, and of course you start, you start with the Iliad, um, and move on from there. So, and then of course with the writing background and, and the fact that I was, I was sort of reading the full canon, um, I started seeing connections that, you know, the Greek stuff led to the Shakespearean stuff. I mean, it's very, very direct. Um, and that was quite, uh, quite intriguing as well. Um, because then you start seeing that there are these universal conditions of humanity and it, it the setting almost doesn't matter but the the that aspect of human nature uh plays itself out again and again mm. um so that sort of gave a sense of, of i guess deep time um that probably showed up as built into the malazan world building um especially since you know, for a long time, um, archaeologists were in the nature of rejecting um, 
any sense of factuality to to the myths mm -hmm. and of course people like schliemann and, and and others who kind of broke that open briefly um with the discovery of troy mm -hmm. um but biblical as well i mean biblical uh, accounts historical accounts in the bible um archaeologists eventually tracked that stuff down and sure enough you know um and, and that made that made perfect sense to me because these, these are histories um and the history is of, of very little value to to the audience unless they are aware of these places right and they can't all be fictional places um so so the mythology and it, its tie-in with with archaeology um was something that i found really intriguing and you know I'm, I'm certainly not the first many archaeologists found it intriguing and that's why you know they would they would look at these ancient texts and then they'd go out into the field and try to find mm -hmm. where these places were mm -hmm. um you know that's that's the thing that sort of inspired um whole generations of archaeologists mm -hmm. at least in the beginning when I read the Iliad, um, one thing that comes to my mind is the, you know, the many names, mm -hmm. the many perspectives, and uh, you know, gods intervening. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, not in a good way because no. they are greedy. Or when I read Malas, and I, I, you know, feel this similarity uh, with, uh, with yeah, as well, and also people who ascend, you know, ascend and descend yeah right so some, yeah some, yeah some... It, it, ascendance relating mm. to uh the kind of demigod status in, in greek mythology um or the children of gods um who have you know partially mortal partially immortal you know powers you know heracles people like that right so um that kind of thing um was a very um very inviting um to the gaming format when you're going to world building um if you can have the gods active to that extent and if he draws your inspiration um say the greek gods or the norse gods or or the vedic gods whatever but there's machinations going on all the time right there's there's rivalries there's um and that sort of higher pantheon um is kind of an expression of human nature in the extreme mm -hmm. right so the rage of 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 uh zeus is 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 far greater than the rage of somebody down the street but they're mm -hmm. the same it's just a different scale right mm -hmm. so uh and that's definitely evident in in um in the iliad where there's a lot of sort of um petty um vengeance and and that kind of thing and, and uh gods becoming you know offended for for the, the slightest of reasons um uh, so <clears throat> that stuff was important but then on the other side i remember one of my courses uh we got in into the what were called the chthonic uh belief systems so that was kind of the uh threshold of the house and and springs and uh nymphs and and naiads and you know all, all of the all those sort of the terrestrial, and I guess marine as well, but terrestrial dwelling spirits of the land mm -hmm. um, and how uh, probably the peasants were more engaged on that level than they ever were on the stories about the Pantheon, mm -hmm. right? That, that's sort of, that's, yeah, that stuff generally relates to, in terms of the storytelling that we read about this stuff, it relates to princes and kings and princesses and, and so it's it's kind of uh the mythology for uh the hierarchy uh, for the mm -hmm. nobility mm. um but your average peasant peasant would be more concerned about um you know protecting the threshold of the, of their hut mm. um and keeping spirits bad spirits away from their children and, and this kind of thing mm. and appeasing spirits to to um help with the harvest and all the rest so mm. This is two levels, or at least two levels, probably more than that, uh, operating. And so, the, the when you're creating characters in in uh, world building uh, or in role playing, um, it's cool to have characters that are operating on one 
on both either of those levels mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yet having still efficacy of some kind mm -hmm. um so that so that the the small actions of quote the peasant um can topple an empire mm -hmm. so it it goes both ways mm -hmm. and uh that was something we played with a lot mm -hmm. Actually, maybe that's logic. Uh, it depends on how, how you view on gods. But uh, I mean, in society today, people shift their roles. But as you know, I read your preface uh, detailed uh, and commented here on YouTube on the preface. And um, <clears throat> one thing I was uh, um, thinking about is the then you I think maybe you didn't do it in the preface, but you know, the the old style of fantasy, you know, only good versus evil is uh, mm -hmm. maybe not the thing you write about in Malas, and it's different. It's a uh, gray, gray, but a lot of values, I think. That's my own opinion. But uh, when I read the Iliad, it's also, I mean, maybe not gray, but it's definitely not stable, you know, good no, versus it's not, evil. It's no. changing all the time. You know, people switch shy. It's more like a soap opera with gods sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it's hard to sort of, you know, you would think the 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 bias is going to be in favor of the Greeks, mm -hmm. uh, and yet you can see throughout that that, in many ways, the more noble characters were were among the Trojans, um, and you know you, you think of Agamemnon. I mean, what a, what a venal, horrible character. Right? <laughs> you know, why would you be sympathetic to this character at all? Even Odysseus, for that matter. Um, mm. So. Yeah, it it's yeah it it didn't it didn't take a um, a simplistic approach um, in terms of motivation for the for the characters. Um, it it threw them into a situation, and we could see both the best and the worst uh, of these characters. Well, that and yeah, that that is definitely something that that Cam and I really pushed uh, in our gaming and then into the fiction. Hmm. Yeah, and that came from you know within you or was it planned you know like you were tired of all these uh, tropes fantasy tropes and then you want to do something completely or at least different or different different yeah yeah um and i mean we, we we practiced it if you will we we played it out um before beforehand in, in the gaming mm. um, you know we had characters who were ambivalent um and then we we were running campaigns that were running in opposition to each other. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes Cam would run two campaigns at once, and one of the campaigns would be the people on one side of conflict, and the other campaign three nights or three nights later would be on the other side of the conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a lot of fun because that allowed us to sort of get into um, the personal desires of, of the characters upon each side of a conflict and mm. and, and see the validity um, of those desires mm. yeah um to me that's more true i mean that it's ambivalent uh sometimes now we're not supposed to talk you know uh, actual politics or what's happening in the world so much and it's uh, that would be an interesting topic to discuss maybe but um, <clears throat> sometimes when I read the news especially here in Europe there's a lot with the Russia Ukraine and everything like that so you get a bit tired reading maybe the newspaper sometimes so sometimes I escape to Malasan <laughs> but sometimes when I read Malasan especially about the military aspect of Malasan I, sometimes some, some things uh, become clearer to me I think um the things you describe in Malasan is a lot of, uh, you know, contemporary reality when it comes to conflicts and ambivalent uh, between uh, countries and leaders and people. And so that's just a reflection I made when to, uh, now when you talked about the... the yeah. Uh, but of course, a lot of that is coming from, you know, having read the histories as well, um, mm -hmm. going as far back as, as one can. Um, and you can see how, how conflicts... Um, how they play out, uh, how they arise. Um, and it's not just a question of saying, you know, it, it's um, always about resources or it's always about this or that. It, it's 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 never that simple. Um, it, it's far more complicated. Um, 
and and then recognizing that once you you sort of explore those things um coming from the west there's a built-in bias you know and and, and you have to sort of dismantle that bias um mm. so and i think sort of reading histories is 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 a really good way of doing that um but not just sort of the western take on histories um and so once you once you sort of leave the the european bound or eurocentric sort of take on things um you cannot help but sort of move into the mythological um and, and the function of those myths in, in terms of uh, of telling um a version of history mm. and of course once once you sort of think in those terms and you realize that well there really is no sort of fixed history um mm. it's it's because it's past it's, it's something we we cannot experience um ourselves um kind of anything goes you know in terms of that history um, we can assume that there are certain continuities um but you know you think of something as as well known and well studied as the roman empire there is so much about that culture that we do not know mm. and we do not understand mm -hmm. um, and so then you go back to to sort of other um periods in in, in human history and we've hardly got anything Mm -hmm. you know in, in terms of evidence in terms of uh the lives lived mm -hmm. um it's just it's just one big question mark so i think that's um has been very uh let's say uh enlight you know a line enlightening for me or illuminating for me reading your books because it spans over so i mean hundred thousands or even more years and you see one empire rise and you know people uh, you know believing in that empire then the empire falls and something new comes and there's you see all these shifts in history so by reading that uh, the way you're writing and when i read that i become a bit humble because then you understand that the uh, identities we fight for maybe today they are not fixed or you know essential they can change and maybe we don't know everything so for me, that has been a, a bit of a educational aspect, reading Malasan to break yeah. down, uh, to deconstruct uh, fixed identities and beliefs. Yeah, yeah, it may be one of the um, the things that makes you were mentioning before we started recording that there were elements to maybe the style or or the vision behind the writing of the Malasan stuff that evoke the mythological um, when you're reading it. And I'm thinking now that one of the things that that may actually have created that, uh, not even intentionally, but if you think of the Iliad, you're, you're okay. You're dealing with uh, numerous characters whose mortal lives um, we can presume to last, you know, fifty years, sixty years, whatever mm -hmm. you know, your average lifespan. But you're also dealing with characters who are either immortal um, or near immortal in some fashion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so their their timeline their time span of, of activity and engagement is is massively extended mm -hmm. um and that's similar to the malazan world so where you've got uh ancient civilizations but long-lived species like the jagut or um or you know the, the ultimate long-lived one the the talana mass um mm -hmm. Now you're suddenly you, you're kind of stretching that experience, experiential connection, that linkage, um, and pinning the history down that way. Um, and what I'm thinking now is, you know, from an archaeological point of view, we don't have, um, at least we don't have a sense of, um, or we don't we don't entertain the sensibility of long-lived humans, humans living. Say like in the Bible or in you know Gilgamesh, eight hundred, nine hundred years they rule. Mm -hmm. um, we presume that that is is um, an exaggeration and it's it's false or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that anchors everything down to uh, the mortal lifespan of a human being. And the reason why I bring that up is uh, archaeology is so profoundly limited in terms of what it can recover mm -hmm. so you can go back 
you know, if you find caves, yeah, you can you can go back, you know, 300,000, 400,000, half mm -hmm. a million years. Um, and once you've sort of left those kind of protected environments, um, then you're looking at small uh, hominid fossil fragments, you know, found in, in Ethiopia or whatever, mm -hmm. and they're just scattered on the ground. Mm -hmm. So, and and the earliest stone tools and stone is the thing that will survive the longest um, mm -hmm. are maybe you know linked to that. They're a million and a half years old, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you think in geological terms, that is just a blink. It's a blink mm -hmm. of an eye um, for the life of this uh, uh, for life on this planet, and. So it's worth sort of bearing in mind that archaeologically, if there were a non-human civilization, a Jagut civilization of six million years ago, we'd, we'd probably find no sign of it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing, right? Because the earth turns, you know, it, it, the continents roll over, uh, the landscape changes. Mm -hmm. um, you got tectonics going on everywhere. So the deep past is kind of wiped clean it, it's it's melted away mm -hmm. and so if it's not like if it's not in our sensibilities um then it it, it has no real impact yeah but mm -hmm. if the jagut of six million years ago on earth built their towers and imbued them with a, a magical a longevity we'd have all these towers kicking around uh, maybe it's just like the, similar to the Cyclopean architecture we're finding all over the world, uh, the mm -hmm. megalithic. Um, and then if they, you know, step out of that tower, you know, mm -hmm. suddenly, suddenly the, the the sense of human humanity's place in the timeline has mm -hmm. just completely shifted, right? It's completely knocked askew. But what it's knocked into is the world of the Iliad. Yeah, right. So that's maybe where the mythology. Um, of that deep time and that sensibility of that deep time has mm -hmm. crossed from, from uh, works like the Iliad and the Vedic stuff mm -hmm. into the Malazan stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. There is always something we, uh, when I, some relatives, not so many, ask about these books because I usually have them, you know, when we meet and I always have a book, usually Malazan book or some other books as well. And they ask about, because Malazan books are always the biggest ones. So they ask mm -hmm. That. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, then I say it's uh, you know about you know we we uh, we don't we can we don't know what we know you know <laughs> I think that's one thing when reading Malasa we don't know what we know we don't know if that's true it could be something else it could be when we scratch on the wall here it's uh, only this wall and we scratch a little bit and we see something you know from past times and then we mm -hmm. and we million years back so we don't know I think that's a uh, interesting uh take for me when reading malas and that that you you'll never know what's behind you never know something yeah, new. No. Something new. i remember when we my family moved back to sweden briefly um when i was five and i have one very distinct memory of uh, i guess we were in Uppsala, mm -hmm. um and we're outside it um uh, where the the barrows are and, and the hills of the three kings and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. i remember as a child uh, i was being shown what was obviously, I didn't know then, but was obviously a barrow. And there was a wooden door in the side of the barrow. And I don't know if that door had been um, placed and sealed um, following an archaeological ex excavation, you know, maybe mm. in the 1900, early 1900s. But it looked like an old door. And of course, my father, um, in typical fashion, basically described to me that this is where the trolls lived. Mm, mm, mm. And mm. a five-year-old, you know, well, okay, <laughs> this is where the trolls live. Mm. So um, I guess the, I, the example, you know, you can find these places and they can evoke a lot of things in, in the imagination. Um, and I think that's that's one of the things that, that fantasy probably does better than any any other genre yeah. um is is the take to take the the physical environment around us and imbue it with something other than what we presume to be the natural state of things 
we have, it's interesting you mentioned the trolls and uh, Uppsala and Sweden, just five minutes from here, it's a forest. And mm -hmm. in the forest, there is a big boulder, you say, like big stone, big boulder. It's um, <clears throat> the scientific, you could say, uh, explanation is because of the, um, you know, during the ice age when the ice Neurotic. was moving, yeah. right? So, but then there is a story here in the community uh, that's, you know, a very long uh, story since many hundred years back. That mm -hmm. it was the trolls, not the giants, they were angry when Sweden was Christianized. So they threw stones. And that's one of the stones. <laughs> one of the stones. Yeah, we yeah, we have we have one here in Victoria yeah. um <laughs> that's that's linked to to indigenous native mythology as well. Mm. And it is, it's it's a glacial erratic. It, it's different from every other stone. It's mm. huge and it sits on 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 the beach. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I thought we should um, move over a bit to because it's it's a mm -hmm. point here to spirituality and uh, Maya mythology, spirituality, malasam. One thing All I, connected. Yeah, it's connected. And there are a few things I I uh, think about when I read your books. I'm as uh, I told you before we started to record. I'm a yoga teacher, meditation, uh, Indian. I mean, in, yoga is Indian, but there are many types of yoga mm -hmm. nowadays. So nowadays, yeah. classic is uh, pranayama, and you have meditation, and you do this physical yoga, but you do it very, very slow. You breathe a lot. That's the basic thing. So there is a lot of um, paragraphs in your books about, I think, meditation, uh, also mm -hmm. tea drinking, also breathing, also mm -hmm. native uh, tribes or um, yeah, native tribes, uh, shamans, and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. For me, it's a kind of uh, some parts, not all the parts of the books, but can be very meditative to read. Uh, mm. Soul feels, you know, calm <laughs> when I read, and I can connect to my spirit a lot when I read Malasan. It's similarly to when I read, like the Iliad, but also some other books, you know, uh, Vedic uh, stories and scriptures. Yeah. So. I just wanted you to elaborate a bit about the spiritual aspect about Malasan, if there is a spiritual aspect. And if so, I mean, what uh, what do you think about that? Or am I? You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if I look back on it, having, you know, all these years since I finished it, I could say um, that, yes, there is a strong spiritual aspect to this. Uh, series if i try to recall my state of mind in the writing of the series i don't know if i was aware that there was a spiritual aspect to the series mm -hmm. um if you recall i mentioned the that that chthonic sort of ground-based terrestrial um genesis uh mm -hmm. and then and then the, the higher gods um Even as an archaeologist, there are occasions, and uh, increasingly so, um, where an archaeologist is is having to engage uh, um, in the recognition of a spiritual component to what it is they're doing. Um, so, for example, if uh, if there's construction, say, in the city of Winnipeg. This will be an example that I went through, um, where uh, the foundations of a bridge over a river were um, were going to be, um, I think, extended or expanded. But anyways, uh, some human bones were found. Hmm. Um, not much, uh, part of a radius, I think, in an ulna, something like that, just part of, part of a wrist. And um, so, with the discovery of that. Um, two things kicked into place. One, the archaeologists are called in um, because the construction would destroy that burial. Mm -hmm. um, and two, the local indigenous um, band was, was drawn in as well. Um, and so prior to excavating, um, we were involved in a uh, shamanistic ceremony, a ritual, mm -hmm. uh, blessing ritual. Um, 
and we did all this on, on a Sunday when, you know, nobody was in town. Um, so it was very, it was in deliberately uh, private, um, not really inviting um, sightseers uh, mm -hmm. to the occasion. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is an aspect that, uh, you know, I, I became uh, increasingly aware of that there's not just the, the, traditional uh, mechanistic view of uh, the universe, the, the, the rational scientific uh -huh. um, point of view that there are other points of view and they have, they are, they are valid. Um, I won't get into too many details there, but some of the things the, the um, one of the, the, one of the elders had to say about these, these two bone fragments um, yeah. turned out to be absolutely true. Hmm. And, you know, she was able to, you know, give us the age, uh, gender, um, nature of the burial to a large extent. Hmm. And so what do you say to that? Right. How do you answer to that? Mm -hmm. um, if you are bound in a mechanistic worldview. Hmm. So so I was experiencing that, you know, as an archaeologist. Um, and it would be foolish not to it'd be foolish to dismiss um, the questions that arise. Um, from those experiences and so in many ways the Malazan series is um, an agnostics approach uh, exploration if you will of spirituality um, whether uh, to the extent to which it it came to any particular conclusion well that would have occurred well after I finished the theories mm -hmm. so it was an ongoing exploration and and because at least in, in, in Canada, if you get a degree, if you're going to specialize in archaeology, your degree generally is in anthropology. So you're covering, you're being, you have courses on cultural anthropology. So ethnology, mm -hmm. which means, you know, all of these other uh, extant cultures, not just extinct ones, mm -hmm. um, become part of your, your, your background of knowledge. So you study all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was always, because of the Catholic aspects, there was always going to be a shamanistic aspect to um, the worldviews of a multitude of characters and, and tribal groups uh, in the Malazan world. Um, and, that, and, you know, in those instances, well, you, 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 you treat them as valid, you know, as the writer, they are valid for the characters. Um, and because it's a secondary world in which um, magic is present, then it's not just valid, but it's efficacious. I mean, it has the power to produce effects. Mm. Um, and 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 once those things happen, then you realize that there is something in the nature of the engagement that invites dialogue, right? Dialogue between um, a spirit and a um, mortal human being, mm. or dialogue mm. between a spirit and or a god and a mortal human being. Mm. And that, you know, uh, it's similar to the Iliad, but less so. Um, it's more that there is a there's a new dynamic to the storytelling you can now you can now engage in, mm. um, and that that opened a lot of doors. Mm. Um, but again, it, it the writing is was very much a an exploration of these things, um, a querying of them. Um, but no judgment, no judgment uh, involved whatsoever. I think um, my impression is that not from your writing, but in general, if you are, you know, agnostic or if you are, you know, very secular and you don't believe in, you know, no God, no gods or no magic or mystery, then you can have difficulties writing about it or um, you know approaching ah. it. But from your point of view, you and if you're from your writing, you don't, you didn't have that. Even if you no. were agnostic, you were exploring it still, right? Yeah, I didn't know. Um, I just didn't know, and and so yeah, those were the places uh, I sort of wanted to take the writing and, and and just explore it and just move into those those other ways of seeing the world. Um, and then sort of um, thinking of, of that world as, as uh, involving, if you want to talk about scientifically, involving 
iterations of physics that that are not consistent with what we know here in this right. world yeah, which does not make them doesn't mean they don't exist it's just they're not consistent with with our our um our instrumentation our technological instrument instrumentation in in determining various um laws of physics yeah i mean so, huh. yeah you well, have the, the um... Like the Vedic, uh, Vedic seers or the Hindu seers, uh, we've seen mm -hmm. things that now can be proven. It, it's about space and you know what's outside the earth, and also I suppose with the Native Americans as well. That's a question I have about the mm -hmm. tribal. Since you write a lot about tribal people uh, in Malasan, you know there is the Malasan Empire, then you have uh, other cities, etc. But that you have then you have tribal tribal people, a lot of different tribes. Um, the fact that you uh, are Canadian or a North mm -hmm. American, I'm not sure how much that has affected your writing um, with, you know, tribal people. And then I think about America uh, and Canada and the United States and the uh, Native Americans and the cultures mm -hmm. that came from, from there. Has that been influential to you? Or oh, is huge. Yeah. My yeah. idea? Yeah, absolutely. No, no, uh, absolutely. Um, Winnipeg... Uh, the city of Winnipeg, where I grew up, um, has the largest native urban uh, population in Canada. Um, so the schools, um, uh, all my summer explorations uh, outside of the city and, and in the city, uh, I, was, I was in constant contact with um, another culture, another, another, um, another way of seeing the world, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, its struggles basically arose out of, of the, the colonial need to sort of fit these people into a particular uh, role and function and and way of seeing the world that was aligned with, with the dominant colonial power. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's, you know, that's that's a that's a generational struggle um, for any culture. So. The idea of cultures in contact and, and cultures in transition, um, I guess, were sort of they were built into the sensibilities of Cam and I because we were both Winnipeggers. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. and then as an archaeologist, you start you start dealing um, at, at a much more intimate level than than you would if you were just somebody living in the city of Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. That's, um, I think, very interesting to to see. Because I also think when you read, I mean, when I read, I put my understanding, you know, my experience uh, clashes with uh, your writing. <laughs> so then I can experience other things that that wasn't your intention, maybe. So I was... And that, yeah, and that's, that's cool. Um, because that's, you know, that, that's, that, that is its own synergy of a kind, right? And it's, um, but one discovers that especially in in the writing of fiction is is juxtaposition is is a valuable um phenomenon um and you can you know in, in terms of crafting sentences and scenes and all the rest um it's almost cinematic in, in terms of the effects it can have on the reader um and you know as a writer i mean that's i i'm sort of aiming for that kind of um connotation uh, over denotation hmm. um, I want that engagement. Um, and there's no way to predict what that engagement is, mm. but that's what I'm that's what I'm wanting for sure mm. for the audience. When I was in um, Pune and my birth city mm -hmm. was, you know, um, I'm active on Twitter or X as they say now, but I was tweeting a bit about um, you know, do you know any good bookstores in Pune or Mumbai? And then it was a guy who was in Mumbai, but he was a Malasan fan, or he is Malasan, <laughs> and reading your books. So it was very interesting to to see. So he had uh, a lot of uh, different perspectives, you know, from his uh, Indian upbringing. You know, living in a, like I think Ruth and Bad has talked mm. about. I think you know when you live in a a culture where politism is alive, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. and then you read your books, then you will get an uh, uh, an other perspective like I've been grown up here but interesting and in, in my origin or birth culture you could say then I haven't yeah. 
of the perspective. But one thing I would like to um, talk about as well that is tied into the spirituality and mythology mm -hmm. aspect is your writing style or uh, how you write, because um, that's my impression that, or when I read your books, I remember the stories. Similarly, like if I read a story from the Bible or from the Bhagavad Gita, uh, mm -hmm. I remember those stories and then they are rereadable. So I read them again, like I'm rereading your books now. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I have a basic knowledge, uh, I add new knowledge, and then I get immersed in it and I get deeper into, you know, what I feel and what I see. Uh, I don't know if it's a special technique of writing, a fab now I say fables and mythology, uh, do you use that or is this just something that happens when I, when I read it or and other people read it as well, who likes to reread your books? I don't know. Um, I mean, because, I, you know, I, a lot of the early fiction I was writing was just almost kitchen sink um, Canadian literature, you know, short, short fiction. And so there it, it's more, you're honing the craft of the writing. Um, but I don't think it, you know, one is, is, is consciously attempting to evoke any kind of mythological um, resonance um, to the story being told. Mm -hmm. um, but then I started, like I, said, I mentioned earlier, I started shifting into kind of the tall tale, comedic called tall tale stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them was, it turned out to be a trilogy of stories called Fishing with Grandma Meichi. And um, the premise is, this is long before Calvin and Hobbes, but think of a Calvin style character. Um, yeah. You know my favorite card, comic book, comic of all of, of mm. all all time. Um, his assignment is uh, to write. What did you do for the summer holidays? And so he tells he writes a story, and he gets into trouble because none of it can be possibly real. None of it could have existed. Um, he's out at the lake um, with the family and his grandmother, and his grandmother goes fishing for the devil and catches the devil. Um, and, and from that original story, I built the trilogy, the two previous stories. Um, and the genesis of that stuff came out of, uh, two things. One was, um, time I'd spent in, in the small town of Kenora, uh, in Northwest Ontario on, on Lake of the Woods, uh, relating to, um, whole bunch of historical artifacts from uh, a particular um, matriarchal family um, that had lived out on one of the islands, um, Lake of the Woods. And um, uh, Cam could tell the story better, but there were a lot of artifacts in the museum from that household. Mm. And they were a bit spooky. Um, mm. And you know, various things would occur down in the basement of the museum. Mm. So that was sort of the one side. Um, and and the other side was, well, there was always a debate in Canada um, regarding uh, cultural identity. Um, and so it occurred to me that basically cultures that move from one place to another physically, they tend to drag some of their stories with them, some of their mythos with them. Um, and But in the process of coming to this new environment, this new place, that original myth uh, is somewhat transformed. Um, it, it acquires local details and characteristics. Um, so I thought, OK. Um, why don't I take Beowulf mm -hmm. and plant it in uh, Lake of the Woods um, in Northwest Ontario? Mm -hmm. And so that trilogy, uh, Fishing with Grandma Meichi, is basically retelling Beowulf. Mm -hmm. So, um, and where one could argue, well, that's cultural appropriation. Not really. It's 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 my cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. um, so, I had no issues with that. Um, but it was fun to do. 
It was mm -hmm. fun to explore. Um, and it sort of gave me an idea of um, that notion of no story, no tale um, can actually be, be nailed down, can be fixed in place. Mm -hmm. You'll have text versions of things, but if you have multiple generations of texts, each one is different, right? You know, they, mm -hmm. uh, when you discovered, when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls and started, you know, mm -hmm. translating them, you can see that, you know, even the Old Testament had gone through multiple changes yeah. and alterations and editings and all the rest. Things were dropped away. Whole entire books were dropped away. Mm -hmm. um, so there is no, there is no fixed um, static past. Um, and so, and, and even though the mythologies are set in those those pasts, mm -hmm. nothing about it is static. And so, um, if stories, if people can move from one place to another, then stories mm -hmm. can move from one place to another. Yeah, and, and both will evolve, and and mm -hmm. both will adapt to the new environment in some fashion or another. And mm -hmm. so, its essence um, may may itself change in terms of the meaning of the story. Mm. So that kind of stuff really, really intrigued me. Um, but you talk about stylistically. I think um, you read a lot of the mythology and, and there is, in many instances, uh, a cadence that's built in that stretches back to the oral tradition. Mm -hmm. So that these are these are told stories. Um, mm -hmm. And the only book that I've employed that cadence throughout was uh, Forge of Darkness. Um, Mm -hmm. a little bit of fall of light as well uh, mm -hmm. i think stylistically i i was i was playing with with um the spoken sentences spoken no. words mm -hmm. uh, but i i had already sort of practiced that uh throughout the malaz and stuff so there will there'll be whole scenes that are like that that have that oral cadence to them that that's built into the style and, and rhythm of the sentences mm -hmm. so maybe that's what you're picking up on yeah, those books are. I really enjoyed the, both of them. So, um, and they have a diff not different style, but they are. Oh, it's different. More it's philosoph different. philosoph. I say more philosophical, philosophical way and more uh, poetic way of writing. I'm not sure, but uh, I felt it was more uh, maybe uh, easier read the the uh, Big Ten than the Forge of Darkness and Fall of Light. It was intended to be, but it, yeah, it seemed but... it didn't. Yeah, it didn't have that the response uh, from the audience that that sort of matched my intentions. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, Forge of Darkness strikes me as a very traditional fantasy novel. Mm -hmm. That's a, a minor question I have. I, I remember it now because I talked with my wife about it uh, earlier. That is uh, especially now, especially now when I'm rereading. House of Chains, Memories of Ice as well, without spoiling anything you, mm -hmm. and I've read Forge of Darkness and Fall of Light as well Not I've not read God of Willing yet so it, it will come later but um, uh, I think I know that there are I mean there are obvious connections between House of Chains and uh, Dead House Gates for example and uh, you mm -hmm. know um, back and forth, uh, books, early books and books uh, that will come later in the Malasan, uh, the 10 books of Malasan. Mm -hmm. uh, but now sometimes when I read House of Chains, it feels like I'm reading Forge of Darkness. I was tweeting really? about that. Uh, maybe it's a spoilerish thing, but then we can talk about it later. But um, uh, somehow it was, you know, only my intuition, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Just, and I started to you know, look in the Forge of Darkness and uh, mm -hmm. about the characters that are in Forge of Darkness and some names in House of Chains that are mm -hmm. connected or uh, more or less connected. Mm -hmm. So um, these connections between the books and especially the prequels, are they planned from the beginning or does it just happen or... I mean, I can see I, I, yeah. you might you might not see them, but uh, sometimes well, between the books. So. Yeah, you would have to give me specific examples yeah. on those connections, yeah. but um, I think it, it it's it's almost inevitable that you know in in the canon of a single writer's you know life life work there will be connections um, because mm -hmm. it's all coming from the same person, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So um, as much as I may have stretched my imagination, there are still limits to my imagination. So yeah. um, things may end up inadvertently repeating uh, in some fashion or another. Or I tackle a theme from a slightly different angle, um, which may at the same time feel like it's 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 something you're familiar with from a previous previous book or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That's right. You know, because this stuff is not it's not looking for the right answers to any of of you know the grand questions of of the human condition. It's it's you know what are the right questions. Um, and stopping there you know if, if one has a sense that you can you can approach those things and circle around them um but yeah but it does not presume uh to provide answers so that basically means that uh every subject every theme is is open and open to revisiting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, there's been no resolution right mm -hmm. at least in my mind Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've reached no resolution so why not revisit if mm -hmm. i feel so inspired yeah i think that's one of the eye openers for me reading the books because before i read your books i had more a uh, fixed way of looking about on society identity how things were and then i think your books opened my eyes to see that it's you know there are um uh, there are no fixed things. Uh, history changed, the world changes, ideas changes, and empires changes. So. Yeah, every every culture is a moving target. Mm. It, it is constantly changing, and and quite often, part of the dynamic of a culture is when um, its desire, born of nostalgia, um, resists the changes that are coming upon that culture in the mm. present. Mm. And so you get this this tension, this push and pull, mm -hmm. um, and of course that nostalgia is not all it it's not fixed to a specific time either. It's it's mm. part I mean partly generational, but even within a generation, you know what people are nostalgic about varies in their past. Mm -hmm. You know, for some people it may be when they were five years old and and uh, exploring the neighborhood and, and being on a bicycle or whatever, um, with no helmet and just mm -hmm. disappearing for the day. And that's their idea of, um, that nostalgic sort of longing, um, mm -hmm. for that, for that innocence, um, for other people and maybe when they're at university or at high school. So those points in, in that past, um, are variable. Mm -hmm. Um, so, that is always going to be pulling on on all of us who are living um, those aspects of our past. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we're in immense flux uh, in terms of how our civilization is evolving because um, technology itself is is pulling us forward faster than we can sort of comprehend it mm -hmm. uh, and manage it. Yeah. It's the thing with social structure is that it's 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 inherently conservative and it, it, it resists, um, change, mm. but implicit in, in a culture is change. Mm -hmm. So it's a contradiction, but they're both in place. Right. Yes. And so when, when that structure starts getting wobbly, um, it makes everybody more insecure and the more insecure you get, at least personally, I know if I'm insecure. Yeah. I would love to default back to the nostalgic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's because really, it's better really, than the present right yeah yeah, yeah. that's uh, we won't have time for that now but uh, <laughs> many thoughts in my head but some i will try to pick out some uh, if you're interested some paragraphs uh more sure. specifically to maybe discuss or or yeah discuss later if you have time or at least yeah. nail about and um, especially um, when you say like that, I, it comes to mind writings about civilization that occurs in the Malasan books in mm -hmm. different perspectives. Yeah. Uh, if you know, if it's development or not, or if it's uh, progress or if it's something else. Uh, there are many it's, 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 yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm undecided on it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it apparently is, the default mechanism for managing large populations. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. But 
you know, beyond that, uh, I don't know what virtue is is uh, implicit mm -hmm. in civilization. Yeah, it's interesting to read about the perspectives. There is a lot of literature at the moment about civilization critique, as you know, I suppose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> other books, uh, other kind mm -hmm. of books. Um, so from that point, uh, Malasan books also are very interesting. They make you think. I think that uh, sums it up, Stephen, Stephen, for this very nice conversation with you. And I hope uh, you viewers also liked uh, the conversation. And I hope we can continue to maybe have an other discussion if it's possible. And if you have time, of course. So that's just yeah, absolutely chance. happy to. Yeah. yeah, I'm very happy to. And also, um, yeah, I, I do want to thank you for uh, broaching one sort of subject that 